I'm Montel Williams. You know, I entered the service back in 1974, back at a time where we had just come out of a conflict where a lot of us who wore uniforms back then didn't receive the same amount of respect that we receive today. But I look back at those times and there are some of the fondest memories in my life. I remember when I graduated from high school, you know, I was so impressed by a friend of mine who had enlisted in the Marine Corps, graduated a year before me, enlisted in the Marine Corps, and had gone away and was stationed overseas and came home because he had been injured during his deployment and was coming home on leave to visit family members and friends. And the pride he showed when he walked around wearing that uniform, that Marine Corps dress blue, blew me away. And I, back then, was a young man who, you know, had done very well in school. I was uh, participated in school politics. I was a president of my class two years in a row. I was a student on the Board of Education. I was a, a member of the Maryland Chesapeake, Maryland and Chesapeake Regional Associations of Student Councils and was very active. But I was also a person back then who didn't have a lot of a plan. I really didn't pay attention as closely as I should have to planning what was going to happen after I left school. When I graduated, you know, I had some choices to make, choices about which college I was going to go to. But I was so impressed by this friend of mine who came home wearing that uniform. I said, hmm, I really think I might want to go and enlist in the Marine Corps. After speaking to my family, my parents, I decided that that was a choice for me. But before I went down to sign up, I remember calling this friend of mine over to my house and having a long conversation with him. And he told me and laid out some things that I needed to pay very close attention to if I decided to go to Marine Corps boot camp. And back then, you know, the options were Marine Corps boot camp in Paris Island, I was an East Coast guy, or San Diego, California. And, you know, I went, hmm, Paris Island, what's that all about? And he explained to me that, you know, this is not, you know, a summer camp, my friend. This is going to be a place that's going to require you to really dig deep, look within, and understand that you're putting on a uniform not because you just want to impress people with the color of the uniform that you're wearing, but you want to put on a uniform because our country needs, still needs defending. So once that uniform goes on, recognize that you may go away and end up being in a place that could get you hurt worse than I'm hurt. And I thought about that. And I think about that now, even after, you know, 50 years, I think back on that time. And I remember making a decision that, you know what, I want to be something, be a part of something that's bigger than just me. I want to be a part of something that takes pride in understanding that I'm going to serve my country in a way that will defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I make that choice voluntarily. And I made that choice. And I think it was one of the best decisions I made in my life. I had a boot camp in Paris Island. And, you know, it was tough. Um, I was serving at a time before the congressional investigations into, you know, violent hazing and you know, went through some things that I think right now we look back at and think that may not have been the best choices that we were making in training our service members, but we were just coming out of a war, coming out of a war that no one was happy with. And I don't begrudge or hold any animosity towards any of the training that I went through. I felt that it instilled in me some things that I needed and I was in dire need of, things like discipline discipline, things like a sense of obligation to something greater than me. It instilled in me the need to make sure I finish a task and get it done to the best of my ability. And so after graduating from boot camp and I was meritoriously promoted out of boot camp, I went immediately to 29 Palms, California where I was supposed to be trained in the communications electronics, but because I had been advanced promoted to PFC coming out of boot camp, I was immediately brought in and put into position as a troop handler, where I got meritoriously promoted to the rank of Lance Corporal. And realized then that, you know what? This is a place that I need to be. 
And after having a long conversation with, you know, my troop handler, who was a gunnery sergeant who was of old school ilk, he convinced me that, look, dude, I mean, why are you here? Why are you here just marking time? You want to go into communications and electronics, but I think somebody with your background and your education and how well you did in school, we have this place that's called the United States Naval Academy where you could go and become an officer. And I recognized very quickly that, hmm, I could go and become an officer. And so I applied to go to the Naval Academy prep school. And at the prep school, it was a tough time. I had been out of high school now for almost a year, a uh, full year, and, you know, I had stopped studying and almost forgot some of those tools of how to study, but lean very heavily on the tools that I was given in boot camp to get a job done and finish it to the best of my ability. So I worked very, very hard while I was at the prep school. And I'll never forget the fact that, you know, I ended the prep school with 40 other Marines and only 20 of us graduated from the prep school. And only 11 of us got appointments to the Naval Academy. And out of that 11, they got appointments to the Naval Academy. Only four of us graduated. I was one of those four. So I was a 90% attrition rate, but I made it. Unfortunately, right before I graduated from the Academy, I went through a pretty devastating medical situation that put me on medical hold. Um, I ended up going into the hospital because I had lost severe amount of, uh, a large amount of vision in my left eye and had some neurological anomalies that would be later, 20 years later, diagnosed as MS. But back then, because we didn't have the information that we have today, I was undiagnosed and literally put in the category of NPQ, not physically qualified to be commissioned. And I was so angry because this was just 12 weeks before I was about to walk across the stage, throw my hat in the air, put on that uniform, you know, salute smartly and walk out knowing that I was going to be a leader of men. And at that time, I wanted to go back in the Marine Corps and become a Marine Corps aviation officer. But unfortunately, because I had lost the vision in my left eye and though some of it came back, it was uncorrectable in 2020, I was not able to go back in the Marine Corps. So I fought and I fought hard. I took it all the way through to the Senate and said, look, come on, I've trained for four years to be commissioned. This is all I wanted to do. I want to be commissioned. And had the help of some senators and congressmen who fought along with me. And I was able to be commissioned as a MPQ officer. They commissioned me then. On my commissioning document is special duty intelligence officer, 1610 cryptologic officer. And because of my language training at the Naval Academy and I had studied Chinese, I was immediately sent off to the Defense Language Institute to study Russian and then became part of our cryptologic direct support force attached to the National Security Agency. And my time in service was filled with, back then, more and more training and more and more educating. I got an opportunity to travel the world. I think I circumnavigated this globe three times. I was served in everywhere from the Philippines to, you know, uh, uh, road to Spain, to the National Security Agency. I was on platforms from aircraft carriers to cruisers to destroyers to amphibious assault ships to submarines. I got an opportunity to serve and spend close to 300 days under the water and well over 350 days on the water, performing my duties as a cryptic direct support officer. And they were some of the best times of my life. Some of those memories that I have right now, looking back, you know, people say to me, how the devil did you stay under the water for 90 days? And I say, you know, I really, time passed because of who I was with. And I remember the bond and the camaraderie that I shared with so many fellow Naval officers and Naval personnel. I worked in a very, very small debt with a group of soldiers that was sent out to sea with me. We had a specific job to do. We got that job done in support of the overall mission and always recognized that that very basic trait that I was taught at boot camp, get the job done the best of your ability, hung with me throughout my entire time serving. I was very fortunate to be 
working with groups of men who did their jobs so well that we all shared in the glory when the missions were finished. I was awarded several medals and several honors of distinction that you know I cherish to this day. And I think that looking back on my career, I recognize that the traits I learned while on active duty were the traits that I used to help propel me in my civilian life when I got out. And in my civilian life, when I started a television career, I remember distinctly, you know, I, I basically walked off of, you know, a base and onto a set. And, you know, about three months into that, working on that set, I had one of my producers walk up to me and say, you know, what you got to understand, my friend, is that you no longer are Commander Williams. You were Montel Williams. And, you know, you bark a lot of orders and don't wait for people to say, please and thank you, you just bark an order. Well, you need to get a grip and understand that barking orders isn't the way that civilians work. We like to have a please every now and then, a thank you every now and then, it kind of snatched me up and made me recognize that, you know what, they're right. I need to relearn how to do things at the best of my ability. And I did so. And that's what helped me, I think, last for 17 years in a business that normally chews you up and spits you out in less than two or three. And you know, the Montel Williams Show had a good run, 17 years on air. We won an Emmy. I won the Emmy as Best Talk Show host, and we were nominated for Emmys multiple times as Best Talk Show. But the one thing that hung true the entire time I did that show was trying my best to produce a show to the best of my ability, using all those things that I had learned and collected along the way in my military experience and applied them to making sure that I did the research, making sure that I studied, making sure that I was ready and prepared to answer every question that was thrown at me, making sure that I gave those people who I were talking, was talking to an opportunity to answer those questions back to me. And I have to say that one of the greatest honors that I had my entire time during the talk show was the fact that I was able to display proudly my burial flag right in the center of my set to make sure people understood my pedigree. I made sure that every year of my show, we did shows dedicated to our veterans and my federal veterans. And though I had taken the uniform off, I really never truly took it off. And I haven't taken it off till today. I've been working very diligently at trying to solve some of our biggest issues that are facing our veterans today from traumatic brain injury to post-traumatic stress syndrome. I'm an active member and board member of the Fisher House and been working to make sure that, you know, our veterans get treated with the utmost respect. And as I reflect and hear from some of those veterans across the country right now, as I'm embarking on other endeavors, they always reach out to me and say, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. And thank you for never forgetting. And that's what's so valuable about the nation's Veterans Memorial and Museum, because we will never forget. We're living at a time right now where our nation is as divided as it has ever been. But the one thing that unites us, the one thing that holds us together, that one thread, and I am so happy that things have changed from when I entered to today, we hold our veterans in reverence. We respect the service that was given by those who have set alone or set out to make sure that they protect and serve our right to be what we call Americans. So I invite you to make sure you visit the National Veterans Memorial and Museum and recognize how important it is for us to always respect those who serve and did what so many failed to do. And that was serve and to protect and defend this constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Thank you.